Uh, we have today with us the most extraordinary selection of panelists. I'm honored to welcome you all. Joining us today in action are Dr. Marina Juba, uh, Senior Science Communication Researcher at Center for Research on Evaluation, Science and Technology, Stellenbosch University, South Africa. Dr. Shuli Mitra, Communication Associate, Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India. Dr. Jenny Metcalf, Director of eConnect Communication and also the President of the International Public Communication of Science and Technology Network. And Professor Ian Stewart, Professor of Geoscience Communication, Sustainable Earth Institute, University of Plymouth, UK. I welcome you all to the huddle. So first, um, maybe I'll invite Marina uh, to, to share her opening statement with us. Marina has over 25 years of experience in the field of science communication practice, capacity building, and research. She has pioneered Africa's first online course in science communication and has trained close to uh, 300 students till date. So Marina, um, how, how do you think the practice of science communication has evolved in South Africa and how is it currently changing? Would you like to... Over Thank you so much, uh, Banya, for this wonderful opportunity. I, I feel honored to be a part of this. I, I thought today, in, you know, science communication has definitely come a long way in South Africa over the last 10 to 20 years. If I look back over my career, there are so many positive changes. But for today's opening statement, I thought I'm going to do something different. And instead of a very academic uh, overview, I'm going to tell five very, very short stories. So I'm really, really grateful for this opportunity and really excited about sharing um, this uh, with you today. So I'm going to tell you five very, very short stories to just illustrate, you know, sort of the context of science communication in South Africa and uh, some of the challenges. So very briefly, a story about a historical figure, Sarah B. Bartman, something about apartheid, something about the golden rhino, the homo naledi, the square kilometer array, and then more recently, the Omicron announcement. I hope that these five very short stories will give you a little bit of an idea of the complexities and dynamics of science communication in this very diverse country where we also face um, a lot of inequalities in our society. And it also struck me as I look back on the history of science and science communication in South Africa, how many um, uh, touching points and sort of similarities and, 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 and shared experiences there, there still are between South Africa and India. Now, the colonial era in South Africa took hold when the first European settlers arrived on 6 April 1652 to set up a halfway station uh, between um, Europe and, and India, the Far East, um, for, their, for their trade routes, basically. So the, the Europeans here met with the um, local people, the Khoi people, uh, who inhabited the Cape at the time. And during this time, during the whole colonial period, uh, science was really seen as a tool to conquer and tame Africa and to um, harness its resources. Colonial naturalists and explorers were keen to collect species for museums in Europe. And these scientific explorations into the interior of the country were often made with the help of slaves. And these European um, explorers collected more than only plant and animal species. And that brings me uh, to the story of Sarah Bartman. She was a Khoi Khoi woman who was abducted from South Africa around 1810 and then taken to France where she was exhibited as an attraction in a museum in Paris, where she died a few years later at age 26. Even after her death, French scientists preserved some of her body parts and got permission to continue with a display of her skeleton and a cast of her body. And it was only when Nelson Mandela became president of the Democratic South Africa in 1994 that he formally requested the French government to return her remains. And it took a while longer. Only in 2002, her remains were returned to South Africa and buried in the Hamtuas Valley where she lived. So... Today, the colonial legacies are still visible in our science landscape. You can see that a lot in natural history museums that look very similar to those you would find in Europe. But based on the story of Sari, Sarki Bartman, you can also understand why many local people still have an uneasy relationship with these museums and with displays, um, especially when um, human ancestors are displayed. And they often perceive these as being Western and alien to local cultures and values. 
And this then also brings me to the dark chapter in our history of apartheid between 1948 and 1994, another period when science was equated with political power and access to scientific information was tightly controlled. So nobody wanted to communicate about science. It was actually kept away from most people on purpose. <laughs> there was even a lot of uh, censorship in the press. For example, uh, during this time, Journalists needed official permission from the government to use words like atomic energy or nuclear power. And if they did defy these rules and regulations, they faced heavy fines and even imprisonments. And consequently, most South Africans, including most scientists, knew very little about, for example, our nuclear capabilities during this time. So another period where, where science was not communicated, um, strategically kept away from people. This thing, the next story takes us back to the ancient kingdom of Mapungubwe, long, long, long before um, Europeans even arrived um, in the Cape. This uh, existed in the northern part of the country. The hill of Mapungubwe was seen as sacred by local people, and they would not even gaze directly at it. But in 1933, a group of white um, adventurers, five people, climbed to the top and dug out its treasures because they had an idea that uh, things were buried there. And amongst the beads and other golden items, they collected this exquisite golden rhino, a tangible example of pre-colonial gold trade of an indigenous kingdom that had developed sophisticated mining and trading by the 13th century, more than 400 years before Europeans arrived. The University of Pretoria purchased the hill and the area around it for archaeological research. And today, the little golden rhino is on display in a golden uh, in a glass case in a small museum on the campus of the University of Pretoria. But this is another um, sort of point of contention because many local people in the Mapungubwe area feel very strongly that the rhino should be returned to where it belongs. And this same kind of uh, tension you also see um, in archaeological and paleontological research. For example, in 2015, when scientists at the University of the Witwatersrand announced that they discovered a new human ancestor, Omana Lady, it made headlines around the world and was hailed as a breakthrough. And Cyril Ramaphosa, who was deputy president at the time, president at the moment, joined the scientists in front of the cameras to celebrate this announcement and this finding. But many political leaders did not uh, agree, they, they contested this finding, they rejected the notion of human evolution publicly, and some went even further, calling it racist pseudoscience intent on proving that black people were subhuman. Perhaps more interestingly, um, there was also some opposition from local religious leaders who said, if this was indeed a human ancestor, it would be deeply offensive and, and disrespectful to them to parade these bones in front of the cameras. And as science communicators, we were reminded that the term ancestor has a very significant and spiritual meaning in many local cultures. The second to last story very quickly is the story of the Square Kilometre Array. It's a massive radio telescope being built in South Africa with a part being also built in Australia. This is the view from the air if you fly across a very remote part of the country called the Karua, very dry, very arid, very sparsely populated. So this is what it looks like if you fly over the area. Now, the scientists involved in building this massive radio telescope are very aware of the need to get public and political support. So they, they make a lot of effort to take journalists there to create public communication about the uh, project, also for the international community. From time to time, they organize these meetings with local people that they call imbizos, where they also invite the local communities to come and find out more. But when you go to these meetings, you can clearly see that these local people face a lot of challenges with poverty, with alcohol abuse, with unemployment, with diseases, etc. And so the scientists come there and tell them about this amazing telescope that's going to put their town on the world map and, and will be able to look back 13 billion years in time and unravel the mysteries of black holes and dark matter. But what these local people really want is they want to know about uh, jobs and, and schools with good teachers and decent clinics for their children. There's also growing opposition against the building of this telescope from some environmental groups and from farmers in the area who had to give up their land and had to give up um, uh, sort of uh, radio telecommunications. So my last story very briefly, I'm sure you, you all know about the Omicron variant and the announcement that came from South Africa that this new um, variation or mutation of the virus was discovered here. Um, so the world reacted very swiftly by imposing immediate travel bans on South Africa and several other countries in the region. 
And this dashed the hopes of many South Africans who were really looking forward to seeing their loved ones, often for the first time in two years. But more seriously, the devastating economic cost to tourism and other industries soon became clear. And so this Christmas, instead of celebrating, thousands more South Africans will be losing their jobs, hundreds more uh, little businesses and guest houses and tourism um, places will be closing down. So it's really a devastating cost on the country. And therefore, South Africans maybe understandably were furious that there is about the response of the global community, feeling it was unfair. And a worrying part of this is that this is this sort of public sentiment that the scientists should have kept quiet, that they shouldn't have made this announcement, that they didn't think about the implications before they made this announcement. And, and even the scientists themselves saying that they're being punished now for detecting this new Omicron variant. Also on social media, there's been quite a few um, expressions of that this new, that the way the world is responding is quite racist. For example, this uh, German newspaper who had a front page story saying that uh, the virus from Africa is with us um, and people feeling that it was really uh, very um, unacceptable to frame it this way. And this was a cartoon in a Spanish newspaper, a South African boat, you can see the South African flag, they're filled with coronaviruses um, depicted as, as black people approaching the shores of Europe. And so this, this kind of thing really um, caused further concern and, and um, anger in South Africa. And um, I saw the other day this meme on, on Twitter where a scientist is saying I, I, he's discovered something and then then the, he's being silenced and says, let someone else. And the person who tweeted this says, South African scientists pay attention. So against all of this background, it's maybe understandable that many global surveys show that there's a low level of knowledge and demand for information and low trust in science. And that up to a third of people in this part of the world don't really see any benefit of science. I didn't want it to be all doom and gloom. So I just want to say that we are now in a phase where our government, the new democratic government is is embracing public communication of science as a way to empower people. We have a strategy for this. We have many organizations involved trying to attract new audiences, trying to use novel and creative ways, music and art and theater, and so on to achieve public engagement. And we've made a start with science communication research and teaching in the country as well, including the courses at Stellenbosch University where I'm involved in. And I'll stop there and just invite you to engage with me on email or Twitter, We'd love to take this discussion further. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. That was absolutely brilliant how you packed the whole evolution of science of South Africa. Africa in, in those five stories. That was absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much. And it, it's very interesting because just before uh, the huddle, we were discussing how there are similarities between the, the evolution of science in Africa and in India. And it would be interesting to uh, see these similarities. And maybe we can, we can do that because our next speaker is from India. From South Africa, we are moving to India to bring in Shuli to understand the scenario here in India. Shuli, like many of us here today, moved from being a population genetics researcher to a science communication strategist and practitioner. She has worked at one of India's premier research institutions, THSTI, and is currently very much in the center of action with the science communication team of the Office of Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India. Shuli, welcome to the huddle. Uh, so where do you think we are Thank now you. of science communication? How far have we traveled? Thanks, uh, thanks Banya, for the introduction, uh, which was very generous. Uh, so. One of the ways we can understand how the relationship dynamics of science and the society has shaped up in India is by looking at the science and technology policies of the government. And I would be using that, uh, those uh, five documents. So the first such document uh, was then called Science uh, Policy Resolution and was published way back in 1958. The overall document put front and center an increase in industrialization for the creation of national wealth and prosperity with a focus on science education and training in technical skill, skills. The next uh, document came in came 25 years later and was called the 
technology policy statement this document discussed the need of the country's self reliance in technology prowess and shifted the emphasis emphasis to technological development in 2003 the science and technology policy was introduced and it talked about bringing together science and technology and underscored the need for investment in research and development what is uh, the one that is uh, more important for us over here is the science technology and innovation policy of 2013 which discussed science and technology led innovation for socio economic development it talks about faster sustainable and inclusive growth and leveraging the huge pool of india's largely young population the 2013 document lucidly puts focus on people and accentuates that the national science technology and innovation ecosystem must recognize society as a major stakeholder the latest policy document tip 2020 is still under public consultation what we can see as we read through these documents is an increase in the agency of public in policy formulation but these policies are just one determinant of the science society connect and the evolution of it different institutions have formally and informally engaged in science communication in india and these include science museums or uh, science centers present at both the national and regional levels people science movements and science journalism i'll talk, i'll let the experts talk about science journalism and they'll a little more into uh, the other two factors so in the late 1970s a committee was set up by the government to evaluate science popularization efforts in india and one of its officials deep dived into san francisco's exploratorium's model of hands on science training this led to the formation of this Nas national council of science museums in 1978 i'll read a quote from saroj ghosh who was the first director general of ncsm he said in a young country with its policies firmly grounded in the need to become self sufficient and educate its large rural masses science communication had to be based on a model where education was foregrounded rather than science appreciation the stress on education by him also reflected in the choice of the themes of exhibits in mobile science museums which were created under the council that included electricity water light and sight and our planet among others today the country has a uh, country wide 25 such science museums and centers this is a disproportionately small number for its large population yes and we do need more of them coming to people science movements in india both the civil society and state considered public engagement of science as an important exercise and quite early on establishment of the kerala shastra sahitya parishad in as early as 1962 was the first intervention in this direction following this an all india people's science network came into being with scientists and science advocates running it together through state chapters AIPS in uh, executed the Jan Vigyan Jatra or the People's Science Campaign where in talks demonstrations stage plays were all used to convey the significance of scientific thinking and developing technological competence with societal benefit as the goal I'll uh, stop now and take more questions later thank you thank you shuli it's it's interesting to see how uh, we we started i think early on and we do have frameworks to guide us it's it's just i think that now we are consolidating all these frameworks and then putting them into practice and i'd like like that uh, you you uh, underscored the importance of science education in the country which was also realized very early on so we will discuss more about this uh, and um, as we proceed with the discussions and now i would like to invite jenny for her reflections on the practice of science communication and evolution of science communication models with changing conditions jenny has been a 
science communicator for more than 30 years, having worked as a journalist, practitioner, university lecturer, and researcher. Jenny is currently the director of eConnect Communications, the president of the PCST Network, and also a campus visitor at the Australian National University's Center for Public Awareness of Science. Over to you, Jenny. Thank you very much, Benya, and it's a, a, a pleasure to be here. Uh, I wanted to say that I actually began my journey as a science communicator 32 years and three months ago, almost exactly. <laughs> and, it was, and it was then that I joined an agricultural research institute in Australia where I was called a communication manager. I wasn't called a science communicator, but that's where my career in science communication began. And that followed a career as a journalist, a high school teacher, a scientist, and before that, a mango picker. So a diversity. But I am, I've probably been working as a science communicator for longer than most of the people who are on this Zoom call have been alive. <laughs> um, and let me tell you, what was a, a typical day over 32 years ago? A typical day back then, I might have been asked to write a media release to promote a new research outcome. Perhaps I was also writing parts of text and finding out information for an annual report. I may have been asked to help put together the text, the text and the pictures for a display about beef production. Um, but that was 32 years ago, more than 32 years ago. And what I wanted to talk to you today about is the three aspects of science communication that have changed over the years since then. Oh, yes. And I will mention it within Australia and also globally. And the, the three elements that I wanted to look at was expansion of science communication, exposure of science communication, and the evolution of science communication. So let me turn, first of all, to this idea of expansion. Now, some of you may be aware of... Sorry, I think there is some technical glitch and we, we will be taking care of that. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know that I... Uh, I didn't know that I inspired so much music. I think it might be Joshua. Anyway, anyway, it's all good. But back to expansion. So in terms of expansion, some of you may be aware of a book and it's called Science Communication, A Global Perspective. It was published last year. It's available freely online from the Australian National University Press. And the editor of that book, my colleague Tos Gascoigne, told me today that it's been downloaded almost 40,000 times. I think that's an indication of the interest and the expanding interest that is happening around the world. There were 39 countries highlighted in this book, including India, including South Africa, and my, um, my colleague Marina was one of the co-authors of the one on South Africa, and I co-authored the one on Australia. Um, and all of those countries were asked to do a timeline of what happened in their country when. When were the first science communication courses? When were the first science museums opened or science centres opened? When were new journals started? When were conferences started? When were science communication associations uh, Miss, I got a question. And one of the... Um, the, the things that they found is that most of those things happened within 2000 and 2010. So in that decade, there was a, a lot of change, a lot of momentum to science communication. And I think that has helped to change things enormously. Um, about 26 years ago, I actually started an independent science communication consultancy, eConnect Communication. Now that was the first science communication uh -huh. consultancy. That was the first science communication consultancy in Australia and perhaps the world. But now there are dozens of science communication consultants, freelancers, too many to even count up. So within 25, 26 years, um, they had this huge change. 
And what we see today in Australia is that most research units employ a science communicator. Um, although the word science communicator may mean different things to different people, they actually advertise for science communicators. Miss, they don't, ad fucked in my <laughs> they don't advertise um, for um, communication managers like or I was, like I was appointed at where I started my work. So we've seen this massive expansion in the last 30 years in science communication. I also think that some of the crises we've faced in the last decade and especially the last two years, like climate change, like COVID, have really put science and science communication in the spotlight. And that is the increased exposure of science and science communication in our society. Whether that has resulted in a good thing may be different in different countries. In Australia, unlike South Africa, trust in science and scientists has actually gone up, which is really interesting, even though there is this element, this very small element, who um, is attacking scientists and science communicators. But certainly with this high profile, it's gone up. And many people are, are looking to experts to explain these very difficult times that we're going through. And they're the people they listen to, not the politicians. That leads me to my third point about the evolution of science communication. I'm sure many of you are aware of the discussions about models, deficit, which is that one-way communication, dialogue, where there's an exchange of ideas, and participation, where we actually get people involved in science. An example of that is that science, citizen science has burgeoned in the last, just the last five years. And if you were to Google citizen science, you would see that the number of references to that has really gone up. So things are changing from just that one way communication of lectures and, and talks to being more participatory. One of the, the, um, projects that I've been working on this year um, and will be continuing to work on next year that I find really exciting is working for a network of international agricultural research centres called the SIGIA Agricultural Research Centres, which many of you are probably familiar with. And I'm particularly working for the gender platform and I'm helping tell stories there about how women are being empowered. And what a lot of the research is showing there is that for women to be truly empowered, researchers need to listen to them. They need to understand them. They need to understand that if they get empowered to do something, it might make their husbands angry with them and then might hurt them. Um, so that whole social, cultural, social norm context needs to be understood in doing the research. And so research is becoming much more participatory in nature, not just in the communication of the research, but in doing the research. And I think those things are going to be crucial if we're to deal with the challenges of society today. Um, I think another big difference is that when I started 32 years ago, there was very little science communication research. And now it is being researched today across the world. Um, science communication today is a profession, a recognised profession. And it is a field of research. And that's not just in Australia. I think that's across the world. Um, as president of the Public Communication of Science and Technology Network, and if you're not a member of that, I would urge you to attend, we're trying to deal with a particular challenge that I think is related to the evolution of science communication. And that is to bridge the whole idea between practice and research. Now, I do both. I do practice and research. And, but I, I learn a lot from other researchers and other practitioners. And that's something that the PCST Network tries to do through its conferences, through its symposia, and now through a program of webinars. Um, our next conference is going to be in Rotterdam in 2023 in the Netherlands. And we're very much hoping that it'll be face to face, although there will be possibly online elements. And that's going to reflect in its whole nature the need to be inclusive and diverse in our science communication. And I think that's our next challenge as science communicators is to really embrace that whole idea of inclusivity and diversity more clearly. 
to conclude, now more than 32, 32 years later, I might be doing some of those things I started off with 32 years ago, but I'm more likely to be working with researchers on an interactive basis to co-create and write stories rather than me just interviewing them and going off and writing it by, by, by myself. I might be asking community members what they think about climate change and how it's going to affect them where they live on the coast of Australia. And so their knowledge, their concerns are important in the whole scientific process and the whole, whole idea of science communication. I might be surveying people in the Pacific, fishermen, fishing, fisheries managers, um, small artisan fishers, um, non-government organisations who support those people about what they want in their communication about their tuna Pacific, um, the Pacific tuna fisheries. But a whole range of fascinating things that I always feel privileged to be part of as a science communicator. And regardless of what I'm doing, I'm very proud to call myself a science communicator. Thank you. Now, moving from Australia back to UK, uh, we have with us Ian Stewart today, who has worked extensively to popularize earth science through television documentaries, communicating sustainable uh, geoscience, natural hazards, georesources, geoenergy, and climate change to public audiences is his forte. He's a professor of geoscience communication at the Sustainable Earth Institute, University of Plymouth, UK, El Hassan Research Chair for Sustainability and the UNESCO Chair in Geoscience and Society. Over to you, uh, you Ian, for your opening statement. Thank you very much, Banya. And, and as everyone said, it's such a pleasure to be here in, in an area that is, India is such an exciting prospect, really, for, uh, for science communication. Uh, but as we've heard, you know, this is, a, this is something that's exploding globally. You know, 20 years ago, as has been mentioned several times, science communication really was in the shadows. It was something that, certainly I'm, a, I'm an academic at university, it was seen as something that you didn't really do. And if you did it, then you could expect your career to be affected. Um, so in the UK, that has completely turned full circle. Um, what's happened is science communication has um, gathered a foothold within the university sector, and it runs all the way up from senior academics all the way down to grad students and even undergraduate students these days. And that's, that's for a number of reasons. Uh, one reason was <clears throat> quite a, a strong culture in science communication and public engagement that started to develop within the university world amongst people who were very passionate. Um, that led to people like myself being on television, scientists being on television and promoting science in big documentary, so it gave a very high profile, but it continued down to um, scientists in the, you know, in sidebars, in advancing their PhDs, comedy science clubs, a whole rich variety of different things. Um, what we've seen in the last few years, I think, is two major trends. And <clears throat> one is the academic community in the UK has embraced communicating what we know beyond the academic um, world as an important part on how we evaluate academics and universities. So this notion of impact, of having an impact beyond simply just citations of academic papers or grants has, has meant that ordinary academics have suddenly become interested in communication. Uh, and the, the, the second thing really is the, the notion that um, it's as if scientists themselves can get a lot of benefit from reaching out beyond. And, and that should be great. That should be fantastic. What we're seeing is universities and academic worlds being out these catalysts for really exciting science developed courses. But my, my feeling is that a lot of this has been captured by a rather instrumentalized view of science communication. It's a view of science communication that basically sees scientific knowledge as a product to sell to a public that hasn't asked for that particular knowledge in the expectation that that knowledge will trickle down and somehow be useful. And so what we're seeing is science communication within universities being ga gathered really under the auspices of the public relations, the, the PR, the media teams, training academics in, uh, in being media savvy, being able to, to work the media, 
um, giving them basic journalistic skills. Um, and then from a, from a projection point of view, uh, you know, we find scientists on billboards in railway stations now for universities. So scientists now are the, the marketers for their universities. It's come to this university. We're amazing. Look at what this scientist does. And I think what that's done really is um, it's given a very narrow view of science communication. It's projecting a science communication world that's based on media, on narrative, on imagery, quite a superficial area. And it's basically selling the academic world. And the reason I say it's a problem is because, you know, if we look at some of the big issues we have for the planet um, with climate change, biodiversity loss, etc. If you take climate change, we have about 95 months. The world is about 95 months to basically get our carbon emissions down. So we're suddenly universities are suddenly caught in this thing about it's actually having the scientists really need to be addressing real world concerns very directly. And, and as we've heard, there's a whole other dimension to science communication, which is this empirical database about how people think, how people take in information, how we can target particular groups. COVID is a very good example of targeting particular subsections of society. There's a whole science to that that's developed really over the 30 years. It happens to be social science, but never. That's, the, that's where it is. So we can tap into that. But those that tap into that, we still generally find that in the universities, you're tapping into that to send out the same one-way messaging that is about the scientific knowledge that the academics produce is actually what's worthwhile. And I think, as, as Jenny mentioned at the end, and, and Maria touched on this too, the real challenge is putting science into the hands of people, actually transforming communities by allowing them some of the choices and understanding of some of the issues that they, they deal with. And we see still comparatively little of that within the academic sector. Uh, and one of the reasons for that, I think, is that the skill set that it takes for uh, that participatory, community-centred, um, people-centred uh, approach, very different from the type of uh, science communication skills that it would be if we were doing what I call make and sell, selling the science out the door. If you're selling it out the door, you want to be uh, understand narrative and storytelling and imagery and things like that. If you're trying to engage communities, you need to be thinking about facilitation and, and, and conciliation and empathy and, and also about developing long-term relationships, not short-term things. And to my mind, what I find is very little um, incentive, certainly in the UK system, to be doing that type of work because it takes a long time. There's not much work in it, much money in it, and it's hard. It's really hard. So I think it depends on how we look for the UK. If we look at, it, at, at the selling signs, brilliant. Fantastic things are happening in the UK. It's all very exciting. Lots of researchers are getting involved in social media, talking about how exciting science is. If we're talking about science addressing the problems and matters of concern of real people, I think it's a, it's a less uh, rosy picture here in the UK. I'll leave it there, I think. Thank you, Ian. It's, it's wonderful how all, all four of you have brought these different insights about the evolution of science communication globally. And uh, we, we have another 15 minutes to, uh, to develop this discussion. Uh, so I, I would like to, uh, I think, continue with what uh, Ian mentioned of how we are more focused on creating the rock star scientist and using the products of science uh, rather than addressing the grassroots problems. And, uh, uh, and this is something that Jenny was also um, mentioning when we were having these conversations of how do we, what do we discuss in this panel discussion. And she mentioned that there is a disconnect between theory, research and practice. And there is this um, minimal use of empirical research to inform the practice of science communication. Would you all just try to comment on that. What do you think about it? I think it's, it's something that we've been talking about for a long time, this disconnect between theory and practice. And a few years ago, I convened a small meeting to discuss this. And it was interesting, during that meeting, I was made, to be, uh, I was made aware that perhaps the disconnect isn't as strong as we think. Mm -hmm. um, and that it's, it's breaking down. Um, but I think what has to happen is that as researchers, we need to get better at 
communicating with practitioners about the relevance of what we're doing. And we need to involve practitioners in our research. There's very little empirical research on science communication that's informing the theoretical frameworks around research. And so I think that more participatory research between researchers and practitioners would be really good. Yes, if I may, um, I definitely agree with what Jenny has said. And I also think, you know, science communication researchers have a, have a responsibility to become better communicators themselves, you know, produce popular summaries of their papers, um, but as Jenny and, and, and distributed in other ways, engage with people about it. And But as Jenny has said, it's not only at the end of the research, it's also what can we do to involve uh, practitioners early on, you know, to make them part of the research. I think that's incredibly important. I would also like, if you don't uh, mind, Banya, just to pick up on something that Ian has said about, you know, science communication sure. being used by institutions almost as a marketing tool. I don't, I would love to hear what, what Ian thinks and anybody else. I don't think we're ever going to get away from that. I think institutions, universities and big research organizations will always use the achievements of scientists as as you know, a way to, to build their reputation and get attention. But I heard somebody say the other day that these press releases that are issued at the end of research projects are almost like obituaries because by that time the project is done, the researchers have moved on to something else. So my question then is how do we get uh, institutions and researchers as well to accept this idea that you can communicate as the research unfolds, that there are opportunities for engagement and for and for sharing the excitement of the process of science. And th this will also help people to understand the process of science rather than just a set of findings at the end. I think that is going to be our next big challenge. And this also links to communicate, you know, linking practitioners and researchers if we take on this challenge. I don't have the answers yet, but I think that's something that we really need to focus on. Ian, would you like to add on to that? Yeah, thanks. I, I was only keeping quiet because I'd had the last say, really. But um, yeah, I, I think that, um, I mean, what we're seeing in the UK, it's, it's driven by the, the research metrics. It's driven by the research league tables. So universities are, that is one of the most important things for universities is to distinguish themselves from the others. So I think what we're seeing is, and Jenny makes the point in the, the chat, you know, there's a difference between PR and science communication. Of course, and, and I absolutely agree there is, but it, my point is in the UK, it's, it's blurring. It's because people are using science communication, the words of science communication, and basically training an army of researchers in how to get messages out that then flood the, the, the web pages, the home pages, and basically are saying to students, hey, come to this university, we're amazing. It's saying to funders, and, and researchers do this too. And the, um, the mention really has been the press release. You know, very obscure papers now, come, almost every paper has a press release as if that would be of interest to the public. It's really what it's doing is it's telling the funders, hey, we've got your name out there, etc. So I think the, the, the old, you know, <laughs> when a science communication, we used to sit in the kind of darkness, really, in a sort of small community. So we've been thrust into the light, but I think people are grabbing hold of the territory. And as I say, what worries me, is that we can get really good at that marketing bit. And, and marketing, you, you know, uses all of the, you know, the basic tenets of marketing are of understanding your audience, your market, and how that relates to your organization. So the, there is overlap with science communication, but that's kind of dominating things. And what worries me is this shift to practice. We need to shift to this practice the engagement, actually engaging real communities in the science. Because if we don't, we're, many of the big issues we face with, we're not going to really address them in time. And I don't see at scale and at pace that happening in the university sector. Uh, I'm just curious, like, we, uh, because we are talking about here about training researchers to do science communication. And we spoke about how we want to bridge the gap between research and practice of science communication. So at what stages in each of your regions is the training of science communicators who actually would get into research or get uh, into the business of science communication, not 
particularly the researchers, but the professional caterer of science communicators and public engagement professionals. I just wanted to understand what is the framework of training at each of your regions, how, how that has uh, that is evolving and uh, um, i i can uh, i think i'll invite shuli first to weigh in what's happening in india and then all of you can join her thanks vanya uh, so in the initial years of science communication training in india the focus was largely on creating a gamut of professionals who could talk about agricultural technologies Science communication, even besides that, has been limited to institutional science, which is, you know, done by uh, professionals who call themselves uh, uh, public relation officers, communication officers, library information officers at times. The professionals who took up these jobs would usually uh, opt for uh, a course in science communication or health communication or science writing. This pool of professionals is. Still very much associated with public funded organizations in, in India. What I find uh, is a refreshing change is the network of private organizations and freelancers also very well trained in communication, whether it is visual uh, writing or making a podcast. These are professionals both with basic and advanced degrees in sciences and at times also social sciences. And, uh, and uh, an enabling ecosystem for capacity building, networking, and mentorship in science communication is still very much an area that needs work in India. Marina, would you like to go next? Just before you start, I would like to also invite the audience to post your comments in the chat box. Jenny has been already answering some of the questions that were addressed to her. And now over to you, Marina. Okay. Yeah, there are some big questions already, I see. So I'll keep it very brief. I think science communication training is another example. It's become popular. There are courses all over the world, ranging from short one-day courses to to long six week courses to you know full master's programs and PhD programs. And, and I think we need to make very sure what we're talking about. Are we talking about practical skills? Um, you know, a quick how to do a, a good media interview or how to create, you know, how to be active sharing your science on Twitter? Or are we talking about fundamentally educating people about the theory and the understanding of science communication practice as informed by research evidence? So I think um, in the PCST, once again, we have formed a, a teacher forum as, as a subpart of the overall network. So people are interested in science communication education at master's and PhD level at universities. We, we welcome you to, to reach out. You can talk to me and I'll put you in touch with the people because we, I think we, we need, once again, we need evidence. We need research in other words, on training. I know some has been done already. But we need to build on that to really develop a body of knowledge of what is effective. What are our goals when we say we train scientists or we train science communicators? What do we really mean? Train them in what? Train them to become what? So I think it's a, it's a growing, a growing field. It's almost become an industry. I mean, many people are making a living out of science communication training and there's nothing wrong with that. But, but I do think this is, there's a big need for more evidence base of what is effective. What are we actually trying to achieve and, and where are we going with this to make sure that it doesn't contribute to the PR industry, but rather contributes to, to responsible and ethical public engagement with science. Thank you, Marina. Absolutely agree with you on that. Uh, Jenny, would you like to be in next on that? Marina always says things so much better than me. <laughs> so I agree <laughs> with everything that she said. But um, I mean, in Australia, we have the Centre for Public Awareness of Science, which is a very big unit involved in training people in science communication. And I think programs like that and elsewhere around the world are marvellous, but they didn't exist 32 years ago or even 25 years ago. And some of the best science communicators that I've worked with and, and that I've, I've uh, mentored or been mentored by um, have had no training in science communication. So I don't necessarily think training is the be all and end all. And someone asked how to start as a science communicator in the chat. And I think the best way to start is to get some experience, go and work with people who are science communicators and see what they do and, and see if you like it and see if you've got an aptitude for it. 
and find out if there are the skills that maybe you need to develop to be to be a better science communicator. Um, so I came from a from a background of being a trained journalist and a trained scientist. So I combined those two quite different careers. But um, you know, there's some great writers out there who've never done science who are really good communicators. There's some really good community engagement people who've never done science who are really great science communicators. So I don't think training is necessarily be all and end all. Ian, your views on that? And then I have a specific question for you as well in the chat. Okay. Um, yeah, so there are, in the UK, there are really some really good science communication courses, master's courses that, that delve into the real detail, the theoretical grounding and, and things that, that, that Marina mentioned. But I think what we're seeing now in universities is a kind of um, blossoming of a whole set of science communication courses that are taught in, in subject at masters and undergraduate level. And that's the things that are largely driven by journalistic norms, et cetera. So the assumption of, of, of um, selling, selling the science. And I think that what there isn't, some of the things that Marina picked up on, is an ethical dimension of what kind of communicator do you want to be? Do you want to be, well, we all, scientists see themselves as these honest brokers, these neutral things, et cetera. But actually, we know that's not true. And actually, there's now a push, particularly as we get to more acute issues, of people actually starting to be advocates and a, and a need for advocates and even activists within the community. And that's very controversial. So I think that what kind of communicator we want to be isn't certain. I think uh, the other uh, dimension really is in terms of you know, this notion of really evaluating what works. There's a massive, you know, set of empirical body of evidence of this, and it's just ignored because people just say, I want to do a web page. I want to do an app. I want to do a poem. I want to... So I think that, um, we, you know, it's kind of frustrating to, to know that there is all of that evidence there and it's not getting used. But I kind of also agree with Jenny. The best thing is just to get out there and do it. And I've met tons of fantastic science communicators who never read about the deficit model. They don't know any of that kind of stuff, but they actually just go into it. And the reason is because they've got empathy. They connect with people. They're able to understand that they're interested in people. And that's the relationship, that two-way dialogue. And actually, just on that, point, it's, it's very hard to train empathy. When you look at the academic literature around what scientists look from science communication courses, it's about how do I get my messages over? Uh, how do I appear uh, trustworthy, etc. It's shortcut devices, you know. Um, so it's not about framing. It's not about understanding the, the kind of scientific way that people think. It's, it's basically a rather superficial, just give me the basics and let me get on with it kind of thing. And I kind of think that's a little bit of a shame. Thank you, Ian. Uh, and the next question again is to you because Aditya wants to know, uh, can you comment on the reason why science communication about mathematics is less? And basically he just wants to know why is, is it the public who is not interested in physical sciences? Do you, know what's, well, yeah. do you know what's weird? Maths does pretty well, actually. Certainly in the UK, there's some really top class popular mathem mathematicians. Um, mm -hmm. Marcus de Satsoy, there's a whole bunch. And they've done well on television with maths. Actually, the only BBC Horizon, which is the science documentary strand in the UK, the only one to win a British a television award was Fermat's mm -hmm. Last Theorem, about a piece of obscure mathematics that only a handful of people knew. Uh, physics does well, we talk about that, but that's really what we're talking about is astronomy and cosmology. Bench physics doesn't do very well. Um, biology, a uh, straight biology doesn't do it well, and chemistry is atrocious on popular television. So I think people, you might be that you think, oh, maths is having a hard time, but actually, you know, the science that do best are the ones that are more relatable. They're either big picture stuff like the cosmology, Brian Cox or whatever, talking about space and where we came from, or there are things like archaeology and earth science, volcanoes and things like that, where you can see stuff. But I think basic science struggles to, to tell its story, really. Um, and, uh, and maths maybe sits there. But, but I would say maths finds way, ways of, of cutting through that pretty nicely, actually, often. Yeah, I think uh, that answers Aditya. And Aditya, you may want to look up the things that Ian just mentioned to answer your question. 
uh, we have last one or two minutes and uh, I have I, I'm seeing the panelists engage beautifully with with the questions that are being posted on the chat. Uh, so I would invite all of you to make that one last comment that you would want to leave us with one last message uh, because we we are we really do not have much more time <laughs> left in this session. So I would first invite Marina. Well, Mania, maybe what concluding thought from my side would be, you know, two, three years ago when people asked me what I do and I said science communication or science communication research, I always had to explain what it was. But I think the last 18 to 20 months have changed that. And now people really appreciate the need for expertise, the need for access to science, the need for public engagement, the need for listening to people as well. It's the last two years, it's almost have been as if we lived through a live science communication experiment. And I think it's an incredibly exciting time to be in this field, both as a practitioner and a researcher. And I encourage people who are interested to pursue a career in this because it's fascinating and dynamic and changing all the time with lots of challenges to be solved, but lots of exciting opportunities as well. Thank you. Shuli, would you like to go next? Thanks, Panya. Thanks, everyone. It was fascinating listening to all of you. So I heard Jenny say that uh, she doesn't need to explain anybody uh, what she does anymore. We in, 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 the, in India, we are very far away from that stage. We still need to explain what science communication is, what uh, a science communicator does. I aspire to be in a place where they are maybe uh, maybe uh, a decade from now, that will happen. Uh, but yes, uh, with the current pandemic, I think the spotlight has shifted to the importance of science communication. I hope it stays there. And yeah, thank you. Shuri, I absolutely share that aspiration with you where we don't have to explain. <laughs> uh, Jenny, would you like to come in next? Yeah, I, I think um, we're talking about this word science communicator, but a science communicator can be many things. And I think in Australia, many people think a science communicator is actually um, a, someone who's on television or radio or in the newspaper who's telling them and explaining stuff and may even be minor celebrities. Whereas myself as a science communicator, um, I say that I help scientists communicate their work with people so they can create positive change in their lives and their environment. And that's something that's a harder message to get across about what science communication truly is. And I think that's the challenge for us still in Australia. Thank you. And over to you, Ian, for the last concluding remarks. Yeah, and just to pick up Jenny's point, I think science communication needs a clearer purpose and by purpose, I'm meaning the way that business uses purpose, a long-term motivating goal that's inspiring, a really clear goal. And that means that science communicators need themselves to have a clear sense of purpose. Why are they doing what they're doing? And that means that those science communicators like myself that work in the academic world, we need to rely on our institutions having a clearer sense of purpose. What is their long-term motivating goal, which is transformative in the way that, that Jenny says? And I think what we're... Uh, we need to find that fast. And I think when we do find it, science everyone we know about science communication will just uh, kind of slot in. So that's my, my uh, appeal. Through these different perspectives that we shared here, we'll foster more shared learning between regions globally. Thank you again. Mm -hmm.